All right, here we go. Good morning from the Sedgwick County Zoo. We're coming to you live from the commissary and Clint is with us. Hey, Clint. Hey, everybody. We're out here live at the commissary here at Sedgwick County Zoo. Uh, we got a great little session for you here. We're going to show you what all the animals eat. So we're going to take you around, let you see how they feed all the animals. And I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Shanae. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see everybody out there. Again, my name is Shanae and we're at the commissary here at Sedgwick County Zoo. Now, for any of you that have ever had a military family, you know what the commissary is. It's that place where you go get anything you need. For us here at the zoo, it's the same thing. So it's not only where all of our animal food is created and stored, it's also where we would get rakes and shovels and rain gear and any of the other items that we would need. Now we are in one of our largest rooms right now. This is our grain room. And if you can look around this room, you can imagine that this is two weeks worth of food for our animals here at Sedgwick County Zoo. We have um, between three and 4,000 animals here at the zoo. So every week we see about uh, three tons of grain moves out of this room and moves around the zoo. Now, I think these grains are fascinating because there are different types of food for different types of animals. Just like you wouldn't feed your cat dog food, um, we don't feed our giraffes um, a parrot food. So Missouri is the brand that you see on a whole lot of the bags and Missouri is actually a line of Purina. So if you feed a Purina dog chow or Purina cat chow, you're actually feeding from one of the same companies that we have here at the zoo. So let's take a look at some of these bags because I think they're pretty fascinating. So if you look right here, if you're pretty clever, you'll notice right away, what this particular uh, bag would feed. Um, this is our wild herbivore diets, giraffe, rhino, antelope, those types of animals. So anything we have in this food is all the nutrition, the proteins, um, the moisture contents, anything else that they would need. Now it's not very fun though. So what will happen is they'll get this as a base diet, but then they'll also get different types of produce along with that to really make it enriching and stimulating. If I ate spaghetti um, and with meat sauce every single day, I might be healthy, but boy, if every now and again you threw in some Alfredo on there or put in some Parmesan cheese, it would make it a lot better. So we try and do the same things here at the zoo. So everything from, from things like wild herbivore diets to if you come over here um, to say this one, you can look and this is a carnivore diet, not as pretty of a bag, but this is made for the bears. So each animal, and this is where science becomes so important in this, anybody who says I won't use stem is wrong because each bag has these nutritional contents in them. And you can see it will list protein, it lists the amount of fat, the fiber. So we need to make sure each and every day that those animals are getting the right amount of nutrients. Now, here's a secret, and for any of you guys out there that have pets, this is pretty important. You can love your animals too much with food. So here at Sedgwick County Zoo, one of the things that's really important to us is that we don't overfeed animals because being overweight is unhealthy for them, especially as they age. It's more weight on their bones. It's more weight on their muscle systems. So making sure that we're feeding the right things all the time is important. Now, as you look around the room, again, you can see all these bags and I'm going to take a step just away from the food in a minute to let you know what we do with the bags when they're done. Um, conservation is our core mission. So we felt like we needed to do something better than just putting these bags in the landfill. So we can do a lot of different things. One, any of these bags like this one is paper. This can be recycled and once a month we make a trip to recycle all of these items. There's other bags like this one right here. This is beet, beet pulp 
Yes, beet is in those little orange, those little purple vegetables. Beet pulp. This bag is made out of a woven fiber. That can't be recycled, but we have some volunteers out there that do a great job taking these bags, cutting them into pieces, and making grocery bags that can be sold in our gift shop. So if you're here at Sedgwick County Zoo, you can stop by the gift shop and maybe find this exact food bag made into a grocery bag or even an apron that you can wear at home. So again, this is two weeks worth of food. It's important for us to always keep a minimum when we're here because we have to think about things of what happens if there is a delivery shortage. Um, what happens if uh, an oil refinery has a problem and there's not enough gas and a truck doesn't get here in time. So making sure that we're always planning ahead with everything is important. So this is kind of part of the bread and butter of the commissary, all this grain. And again, all of this grain will move out every two weeks. But we have some pretty interesting things right around the corner. Hey, as we move, we want to shout out to, uh, we got some friends at Robert Martin Elementary in Andover. We got Jefferson fifth graders here. We have fifth graders at Cessna, Ortiz Elementary, and Junction McLean. City. Junction, Junction City, City. All right. in the house. That's great. Well, I hope that all of you have a chance to come to Sedgwick County Zoo. And we're in right now in an interesting room. I like to call it our enrichment room because in this room, you'll see some things that are maybe more familiar to you. I bet, for example, some of you might have applesauce as part of your lunch. Um, this is where we keep things to keep animals enriched and stimulated all the time. So some animals to make their diets more exciting, a little bit of applesauce on top might be great. Or or maybe if an animal needs some medicine, but uh, we can't just tell them to take that pill, we can grind that pill up and put it in applesauce and then it becomes a treat for them instead. Um, as you can continue to go again, you see things you see in your own grocery store at home with things like honey, Gatorade, um, one of my favorites, ranch dressing. So there's a lot of different things where our, our keepers in this area are creative with figuring out how we can bring different items in to make sure that we're always keeping the animals as healthy as possible. Now, one of the most expensive things in this room is actually a vitamin E oil. Um, it's over $400 for a, a, a gallon of that. So that goes to say the rhinos and the elephants, their skin is so tough that having that vitamin E oil helps their skin, helps make sure that they don't have problems with dry skin. So really interesting different things in here. Even here, if you look at baby food. So baby food is a great way that we can, again, work with some animals that maybe need to have some sort of special vitamins or medicines in their food. Um, some of you guys might uh, recognize this one, a little bit of Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid can be something that's mixed up. Our primates often will do Gatorade or Kool-Aid and have their medicines mixed up in that to make sure that they take that at will. Now, one of my all-time favorite stories, however, here at the zoo was of an orangutan. She loved oranges but was one of the smartest animals I'd ever met. So our veterinarians thought, well, we'll just get, she had a cough, we'll just get orange flavored medicine, just like maybe some of you guys have taken at home. Um, well, she took one taste of that and knew it was wrong. So at the time, Dr. Bryant, our chief veterinarian, got really clever. He took some oranges home, he drilled a hole in the orange, and he tells me he sat watching TV, rolling the juice out of the oranges all night, and then he used those oranges that now had room for more fluid. He injected the medicine into that orange. It kind of soaked in, and even though the orangutan could sense something wasn't quite right with that, um, that was the best way to give her medicine. So always trying to be creative with some of those different pieces as we go through. Now, if you do have some pets at home, you might also notice and recognize some of the things over here. Um, if you have fish tanks, just like you guys buy fish food, so do we. If you have anything like um, a, a gecko, rapashi, you can see a whole lot of the foods there that we feed as well. 
So a lot of the things that you'll see here are some of the exact same things that you might uh, purchase for your own pets or even for yourself um, to make sure that you have everything that you need as well. Now, as I mentioned, the commissary, just like in the military, is for everything. We, even if we need uniforms or buckets or rubber gloves or any of those items, all of that comes from the commissary. So we just do a requisition. Um, and then within usually 24 hours, all of that comes to us um, and allows us then to make sure that we always have the 100% best care of the animals at all times. So I always love coming in here and seeing all the uniqueness of all the different items that are in here. So let's walk. We talked about the dry goods. We've talked about some of the enrichment or different ways that we can keep um, the animals healthy with medicines or with vitamins. Let's look at some of the produce, some of the things um, that, that the animals really love to dig into. As we walk, um, we have a question here. What animal eats the most? Uh, well, you know, it, that's a hard question because, of course, the answer is the elephants because they're the biggest. Um, but per bulk, um, it really kind of just depends on the metabolism. So some of our bird species that have very, very high metabolisms, you'll see they need to eat more because they go through it so fast. Where an elephant, although they're eating more, um, they're not necessarily going through it so fast. So it's a little bit of a trickier answer maybe than just it's the elephant. Uh, because it just depends on the size of the animal. But some of those birds really, really go through food pretty fast. And so you have to make sure you're giving them everything that they need to keep healthy. So speaking of keeping healthy, we can take a look in here. Clint, if you want to take a walk up in there and look at some of the produce. Now, one of the myths that are sometimes uh, with a zoo is that the zoo will feed out the produce, which is the fruits and the vegetables that humans can't eat. Um, I'm here to tell you that, by gosh, something like this cucumber is the exact same cucumber that you would see at the grocery store. Um, everything here is just as fresh um, as it would be as if you bought it. Some really nice greens here. You can see here the collard greens are great. By the way, the grizzly bear loves collard greens, loves celery and lettuce. We'll leave the apples and the sweet potatoes to the end. Um, same thing here. Some of the things you see, cabbage, same kind of stuff that you would get there, we feed out. If we get in produce that isn't good quality, we don't use it just like you wouldn't use it at home. One of the things that always amazes me is the size of a sweet potato. So any of you that are sweet potato fans out there, these are some of the biggest ones that you'll find. And this is also one of the reasons when we do diets, we don't say this animal needs one sweet potato. Because what if one day one sweet potato is this big and then the next day it's this big? There's a slight difference in size there, so the animal is getting a different amount. So instead, everything is either weighed out or measured out. So instead, they might get 80 grams of sweet potato instead of one sweet potato. So lots of different resources here, but the most important thing to know is just like you and me, you could take a bite out of these tomatoes and they would be just as delicious for you as they might be for one of the animals here at Sedgwick County Zoo. And it's cold in here too, Clint, right? It is very cold in here. But wait, we'll get even colder here in just a few minutes. So we're going to step back out. Look at all these carrots. And we're going to walk into where the magic happens in the room. So we're in our kitchen now. This is where all the diets in the zoo are made. Now our commissary staff is amazing. First of all, they have a shift that's different than anybody else. They work from six in the morning until three in the afternoon. So if you're an early bird, working in a commissary is a great place for you. They also have their hands on a little bit of every animal because they're the ones that make sure that the animals have what they need to be healthy each and every day. So where the commissary keepers might not be uh, sweeping and cleaning up after an animal, they are producing the stuff 
that the rest of the keepers sweep and clean up, um, which is a really, really important aspect of the zoo. So we are always one day ahead whenever we make our diets. So today they were actually making diets for tomorrow so that we can always make sure that we have everything that we need. If they open a box of apples and realize they're bad, we have time to get what we need in between. Um, all of that diet prep happens in here and each and every animal has a different process of what it needs. Now again, conservation is a key to us, so we also really make sure to focus on when we deliver those diets out, that we're delivering them out in a repurposing way. Um, so instead of putting things in baggies, you'll notice buckets, you'll notice containers um, that we put that food in, the keepers then wash those, sit those out for the commissary staff that then bring them back in every day and start that whole process over again. Uh, so lots of the things that you would see in a regular restaurant, you'll see here at Sedgwick County Zoo in our commissary. Let's look at the diets that are coming up. It's going to be pretty crowded in here, but I think we can squeeze in. All right, Clint, you thought it was cold before. We're going to get a little colder. So if we look in here, you can see we have today's diets and we have tomorrow's diets. You can also see all the buckets and the containers that we use. Our goal is to send nothing out that needs to just simply be thrown out unless it's processed that way. Um, sometimes we can get really unique things. Anybody know what those are? If you guess kiwi, you're right. So sometimes we have really unique things in those diets that can either be enrichment something that is just new and exciting for the animals or could be part of their regular diets. Um, but again, celeries, greens, sweet potatoes, apples. Now you might be saying to yourself, but what about the animals that eat meat? We have that too. As a matter of fact, Clint, if you come right over here, you can see some of the meats that we have. We work with a company called Nebraska Brand Diets. Um, they make a pre-processed meat, and that meat can go in four different things. There's our senior meat. This is a carnivore meat for your animals that are older and need a little bit of a different nutrition content. We have a feline meat, and we have, I can't pull them out, they're frozen, they're frozen to the bottom. We have a feline meat and a canine meat. All of those then are processed just slightly differently depending on what that animal needs. My, for me, one of the most interesting meats is a bird of prey diet. Because if you think of a bird of prey like a, a hawk, when that hawk eats that mouse, it eats everything. The fur, the bones, the food that the rodent ate itself or the food that the mouse ate. So the bird prey diet has to have all of that in there. If you pull it apart, you can find all sorts of different little things because that is what the animal would need. Now, we also do feed, and don't worry if you're a little squeamish, we won't show this. Um, we also do feed things though like um, pre-killed chickens, rabbits, mice, and rats. Um, because there are some animals that really need to have more of that tactile experience and that's important to them as well. Plus, we'll feed out big bones. So you might be here at the zoo one day and see an animal chewing on a rib bone or a shank bone. Um, all of those are important for the animal's teeth. Um, it's important for their mental stimulation and of course it's important for their digestion as well. So we always need to look at how we can be creative with those things. Now for our meat, we go through about uh, 54,000 pounds of meat a year. Produce, we spend about $4,000 a week on produce. Um, I think something like around 55,000 apples we use every year. So it is as large scale as any restaurant might be. Um, but this is where kind of that magic happens. If we pull a diet off here, you can see what happens is the we will get it prepped like this. So they'll use the big blenders that we have to blend them up into an area where it's edible for the animal's mouth that size. That's important. If you're feeding a small animal, you can't give them just a giant sweet potato. 
you have to cut it to those sizes. So most of this diet is cut small, but you notice there's a couple of big pieces that then would be enriching for that animal to be able to poke at, to fling around and do some of those pieces with. So really, really good quality stuff. And I can't tell you the amount of times that I've been working on animal diets and I've gotten hungry myself. We're gonna go ahead and we'll walk back out of the cooler because I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little chilly. A little cold in there. And, and Clint, we'll take... we have, we've got a question. We wanna know which animals eat the least and eat the most. Brooke, can you say that again? So sorry, we were trying to shut the it's cooler. It's all good. We have a lot of questions of which animals eat the most and which eat the least. Uh, again, so that's kind of hard to say because it depends on size. So elephants obviously eat the most. Um, elephants will eat uh, the, the hay that we give them, but we also work with about a dozen different tree companies that will come in and bring us the trees that they have cut down, and those elephants rip those trees apart all the time. Um, the animals that eat the most, again, would be your smallest animals. So some of our invertebrates, for example, that are just tiny little beetles, they'll often eat the least. Now we have one last place to go, and I know we're almost out of time, but we're going to go experience our giant freezer. If we thought it was cold in there, we have no idea what we're experiencing next. So let's walk this way. So what animal would eat a bell pepper? A couple of different animals will. Sometimes the primates like the bell peppers. Um, sometimes they can be enrichment or something new. So an animal like a turtle might not normally eat a bell pepper, but the green or the yellow or the red might be a new experience for them. So doing some of those types of things can be um, very handy for them. So uh, bell peppers can be an added piece or they can be an enrichment piece. So when we uh, had penguins and pelicans added to our population here at the zoo, we had a dilemma. What do penguins and, and pelicans eat? Lots and lots of fish. Well, at that point, we had our, our cooler that you saw there, but that was the largest freezer we had on site. So when we knew we were going to be getting lots of fish eating animals, we got the giant freezer. So the interesting thing about fish is that some species of fish are only harvested once a year. So we have to use great math and great science to determine when those deliveries are going to be made and that we have enough for that. Uh, so we had to build a giant freezer that can hold all that. We generally will hold six months to a year of fish and about three months of meat. Are you ready to get really cold? Bring it on. All right, we're going to go in. I'm going to warn everybody, it can be a little slippery, so be careful. All right, Frozen has nothing on this room. So we talked earlier, I don't know if you can hear our ice crunching, but it is colder than cold in here. Now for everybody that sees those old fashioned movies where people get stuck in the freezers, don't worry, that can't happen anymore. But on this side, you can see all of the fish. And then on the other side, you can see those meats that we purchase as well. Um, so this gives us the space to make sure that we can keep all of the foods in here to make sure that we can keep the animals as healthy as possible at all times. Okay, Clint, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to get out of here. It's, it's pretty cold. I love winter, but uh, that's a pretty strong dose of winter right there. All right, guys, I hope you've enjoyed as we've walked around and learned about some of the different foods that we feed here at the zoo and the care and the science that goes into each and every animal. We don't just go, oh, we think this animal would like this. There's a science behind it all. So if you're wanting to know how to work with animals, stay in school, study, learn about nutritional content, know about science techniques, know about math, because they use because they use math each and every day to determine how much food that they need to create. So one question yes. before we sign off here is, 
how do you how do you keep track of all the different things that each different animal eats? So that's a great question. Um, different areas do it differently. Some an some areas say if you feed out 800 grams of food, and the next day when you're picking that food up, you weigh it again, and you know there's 400 grams left. So then you know that animal ate 400 grams or 50% of its diet. Some do it as an eyeball. You know you gave them a half a cup. You look, you see approximately how much of that is left, and then you record that. But document, document, document. We document when an animal eats, when an animal goes to the bathroom, when an animal's moving funny. All of that is important so that we can keep that long-term data to make sure that the animals are always healthy. And is that done on a computer? Uh, the answer is yes, but. Um, yes, but it generally starts out on paper. So generally we have uh, sheets. We usually do dry erase sheets in areas. We write all that down and then it gets transferred onto the computer. Excellent. And one last question for our friend Gavin, who wants to know, how do you feed the bear? Oh, so that's a great question. One of the best ways to feed the bear is the keepers can actually go up above um, their pool and they can just toss the food over. Um, one of the things that sometimes people mistake is that we go in with the animals here at the zoo. Um, and my kind of running answer to that is you might only do that once. Um, because the animals all here are inherently dangerous um, and they are wild animals even if they live with us. So we need to make sure that we're always careful with them. Some other animals we can transfer food back and forth. So we might move an animal into a bedroom, lock that door, and then we can go in and clean and take care of everything. And once we're done, we let them out and they run around and find all their favorite foods. <laughs> That's great. Um, Mrs. McDowell's students are wanting to know how much water does each animal need? It, it depends on the animal. You know, an elephant, an elephant can uh, use about 300 gallons of water a day. So that's obviously a whole lot of water. A uh, fish needs water 24 hours a day. Uh, we are fortunate here at Sedgwick County Zoo in that we have three wells at the zoo. So most of the water that we use for the animals is well water. So we don't have to worry about, say, the chlorines and the chloramides that are in them that although we need them, can be kind of difficult on some of the animals. And if Mrs. McDowell's husband works here at the zoo, we have a Mr. McDowell here at the zoo whose his wife is a teacher. So if that is you, hi out there. That's awesome. All right, Everybody. Clint, it's time for the selfie. Oh, okay, yeah. we're, gonna, we're gonna go back in here for our selfie. We're gonna take a freezing cold selfie. So we're gonna get we can, in place. We can do it right here with this, okay. Here we go. Does the rest of the team want to come in? Yeah, come on. We in got in. a couple others that have been helping us here. We'll all and jump classes, in here. This is teachers. You need to go to the back of the room and have the students have their backs to the screen so you can get a photo of everybody together. We'll give you just a moment to get in position and then we'll let you take your photo. Just a moment. Okay, teachers, here you go. All right, friends at the zoo, wave, hold your hands up, and we'll give you just a count of 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Well done. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and Thanks, hopefully you can everybody. come back and join us at 1130 for the golf cart safari. Thank you, Sinead. Thank you, Clint. Have a great day, Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye everyone.